Hello, everyone. Welcome to a special CUBE conversation. I'm John Furrier, the co-founder of SiliconANGLE and theCUBE. We're here in Sundance 2018 at the Intel Tech Lounge for a panel discussion with experts on the topic of the new creative. And we believe a new creative renaissance is coming in application development and also artistry, the, the role of craft and the role of technology and software coming together at the intersection. You're seeing results in the gaming industry, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality. A new wave is coming and it's really inspiring but also there's a few thought leaders at the front end of this big wave setting the trends, and they're here with us in the special panel for the new creative. Here with us is Brooks Brown, Global Director of VR at Starbreeze Studios. A lot to share there, welcome to, to, the, to the panel. Lisa Watts, VR Marketing Strategist at Intel. Intel powering a lot of these VR games here. And Winslow Porter, co-founder and director of the new reality company. Many submissions at Sundance, not this year, but a ton of experience to talk about the role of Sundance and, and artistry. And we have Gary Red, Radburn, who's a director of commercial VR and AR for media within Dell, Dell Technologies. Uh, guys, welcome to this panel. Lisa, I want to start off with you at Intel. Obviously, the tech lounge here, phenomenal location on Main Street in Sundance. Really drawing a massive crowd. Yesterday, it was packed. This is a new generation here, and you're seeing a younger demographic, you're seeing savvier consumers, they love tech. But interesting, Sundance is, is, is turning into kind of an artistry tech show, and the game is changing. Your thoughts on this new creative? Yeah, it's been uh, amazing to watch. I've been here for, this is my third year coming back with uh, VR experiences, and um, it's really just been incredible to see. I mean, Sundance has been on the leading edge of exploring new technologies um, for a long time. And I think this is, I feel like, you know, this feels like the breakout year, really. I mean, it's been successful the last few years, but something about this year feels a little bit different. And I think maybe it's that people are getting more familiar with the technology. I think the artists are getting um, more comfortable with how to push the boundaries. And then we certainly are getting a lot out of um, seeing what they're doing and, and how we can improve our products in the future. We were talking yesterday, Lisa, about this, uh, the dynamic of, at Sundance. And you were mentioning that you see a few trends popping out. What is the most important story this year for the folks who couldn't make it, who might be watching this video, that you see at Sundance? Obviously, it's a great day today. It's snowing. <laughs> it's, a, it's a white day. It's beautiful powder, greatest snow on earth. But there's some trends that are emerging. We had a march this morning, the Women's March. You're seeing interesting signals. What's, what's your view? Um, I think there's a lot less um, um, desire to put up with uh, subpar experiences. I mean, I think everyone is really starting to push the boundaries. I mean, we saw a lot of 360 video, which we love for a linear narrative. Um, um, but they're, they're really breaking out and really exploring what does it mean to have you know, autonomy, and especially in the virtual reality experiences, a lot more social. Um, is coming to the forefront, and then a lot more exploration of haptics and um, the new ways of you know extending into you know more 4D FX, et cetera. So I think um, it's very, very, very exciting. We're really excited to see all the new innovations. Winslow, I want to ask you if you could comment. Uh, you've been an active participant in the community with submissions here at Sundance. This year, you're kind of chilling out, hanging out. Uh, you've been on the front lines. What is your take on the vibe? What's the sentiment out there? Because you're seeing the wave coming. We're feeling it. It feels early. I don't know how early it is, how, and, and the impact to people doing great creative work. What's the take? Well, yeah, it's kind of like VR years or like dog years, you know? Like a lot can happen in even a month in the VR space. So even, so I had a piece here in 2014 called Clouds. It was an interactive documentary about creative code, but that was back when there was only two other VR pieces. And it's interesting to see how, you know, the landscape has changed uh, because CCP Games had a piece there they had an early version of Eve Valkyrie, and unfortunately, in the last three months, they had to close their VR wing. So, and then Chris Milk also had a, a Lincoln piece with Beck, um, which was a multi-camera 360. Actually, it was a flash video that they ported to the DK1, um, and so that was you know. But seeing that, everyone was you know saw the potential. The, the technology was still pretty rudimentary or crude, even we should say, uh, before any tracking cameras. Uh, but every year, people you know, learn from previous Sundances and other festivals, and we're seeing that Sundance kind of raises the bar every year. It's nice that it's in January, because then there's all these other festivals that sort of follow through uh, with either similar content, newer versions of content that's here, or people have just sort of you know, learned from what is here. So I gotta ask you, you know, obviously Sundance is, is known for pushing the boundaries. You see a lot of uh, creative range. You see a lot of different stuff. Uh, and also, you mentioned the VR. We've seen some failures. You've seen some successes. But that's growth. I mean, this market has to have some failures. Failures create opportunities. The folks are reiterating in that. 
what are some of the things that you can point to that are a positive uh, things that have happened, whether they're failures and or successes, that folks can learn from? Well, I think that uh, this year there's a lot more social VR. We're connecting people uh, in this, even though they're in the same space, they're able to, to be in this new virtual like, world together. Um, there's something amazing about being able to interact with people in, in real life, but as soon as you have sort of a hyper reality where people are able to, to be uh, you know, experiencing a, a Sufi ritual together, or you know, things that you just wouldn't normally, that, that are not possible in, 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 the, in the real world. Um, and also, I think that there's issues with lines too, obviously every year, but the more that we can have you know, larger experiences with, with multiple people, the more people we can get through, and then the more impact we can make on the audience. Uh, it's, it's really, it, we were in Claim Jumper last year, and we can only get one person in every 10 minutes, mm -hmm. and that makes things pretty pretty tricky. And what are you doing at Sundance this year? And you obviously got some stuff going on with some of the work you've done. What's, uh, what's your focus? So yeah, we have a company called New Reality Company where we <laughs> produce Giant and Tree. The, the, it's part of a trilogy where Breathe is gonna be the third part. Uh, we're, we're gonna be completing that uh, by the end of this year. And uh, right now, you know, I would say the best thing about Sundance is the projects, but also the people. Being able to come here, check in, uh, meet new people, see partners that we've been working with in the past, uh, also new, you know, like new collaborations. There's everywhere you turn, there's like amazing possibilities abound. I want to talk about empathy and social. You mentioned social is interesting in, in these trends. I want to go to Brooks uh, Brown, who's got some really interesting work on with Starbreeze and the Hero Project. Um, you know, being a pioneer, you know, you got to take a few arrows on your back. You got to blow people's minds. You're doing some pretty amazing work. Um, you're on the front lines as well. What's the experience that you're seeing? Talk about your your project and its impact. Well, for us, uh, we, we set out with uh, our partners, Ink Stories, Naveed Kansari, a wonderful creative and his entire team, to try to create uh, an intensely personal experience, kind of moving the opposite direction of these very much social things. Uh, the goal ultimately being to try to put a person inside of an event rather than a game style situation where you have objective A, B, or C, or a film that's a very, very hyperlinear narrative. What is that sort of middle ground that VR itself has as a unique medium? And so uh, we built out our entire piece, uh, deep 40 effects, the, everything is actually physically built out, so you have that tactility as you walk around. Uh, things react to you. Uh, we have smell, temperature, air movement. Uh, the audio provided by uh, our partners at DTS is exceptional. And the goal is ultimately to see if we put you in a situation, I'm doing my best not to talk about what that situation is, it's pretty important to that, uh, but to watch people react. And the core concept is, uh, would you be a hero? Uh, all over the world every day, people are going through horrific stuff. We're fortunate because we're the kind of people who, in order to experience, say, a tragedy in Syria, we're fortunate that we have to go to Park City, Utah, and go in virtual reality to experience something that is uh, tragic, real, and deeply emotional. And so our goal is to put people through that and come out of it changed, uh, traumatized, actually, uh, so that way, you have a little bit more empathy into the real world, into the actual experience. And what's the goal? Well, and this is this is interesting because most of the some stuff you see the the sizzle uh, out there is oh look at the beautiful vistas and the beaches and the, the peaks and you can almost be there. Now you're taking a different approach. You're putting people in situations that you know probes some emotional yeah. response. It, it's, some a, it's a big deal to us. Uh, the way Naveed likes to put it, and I, I'm going to steal this from him, is uh, you see a great deal of people prototyping on hardware and all of these things, and it's great because we need that. We need to be able to stand on the shoulders of those giants to be able to do these things. But uh, you see very few people really prototyping what is the concept of story as per VR. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, I've, we've been doing at Starbreeze, we've been doing location-based VR for some time now, and I've been getting thousands upon thousands of pitches. And whenever you get a pitch, you can pretty much identify, oh, you come from a film background. You come from a games background. It's very few people who come down that middle line and go, well, this is what VR is supposed to be. This is, this is that interesting thing that makes it very deeply unique. What's the, what's the confluence and what's the trend in your mind as this changes? Because you mentioned that you know, gamers have affinity towards VR. We were talking about that before we came on the panel. You know, pump someone in mainstream USA or around the world who does email, <laughs> does work, may not be there. You're seeing this confluence. How is that culture shifting? What do you, how do you see that? Because you're, you're kind of bringing a whole nother dimension. Well, we're trying to, and to go back to a little bit, uh, something about this Sundance being a little bit different. Uh, I think in, in general in VR, you're seeing this sort of shift from uh, a few years ago, it was all potentiality. And I think a lot of us, the, the projects were great, but a lot of us who work in VR were like, oh, I, I see what they're trying to do. And people like my dad would be like, I don't, I don't see what they're trying to do. <laughs> uh, uh, but 
that, that is shifting. And you're seeing a, a larger shift into that actuality where we're not quite there yet, where we can talk about you know, the experiences everyday Americans are gonna have. What is the real Ready Player One that we're actually going to have existing? We're not there yet, yeah. but we're much closer every time, and we're starting to see a lot of these things that are pushing towards that. Final question before I go to some of the speeds and feeds questions I wanna get with Intel and Dell on is, what is the biggest impact that you're, you're seeing with your project, NVR in general, that will have the most um, uh, important consequences for societal impact? Well, uh, we, we were fortunate yesterday, we had a number of people come through Hero. Uh, and a number of them uh, simply actually couldn't handle it, had to come out. Uh, we had to pull people out. The moment we took the headset off, they were, tears were streaming down their face. Uh, there's a level of emotional impact. VR is extremely able to cut through. It's not that you're playing a character. It's not that you're in a separate world. You are you inside of that space. And that, that, that is a dangerous but very promising ability of VR. Winslow, can you take a stab at that too? I'd like to get your reaction to that because you know, people are trying to figure out the societal impact in a positive way and potentially negative. Yeah, I mean, so with that, you know, whenever you traumatize somebody, you also have the ability to possibly re-traumatize somebody. Um, in Giant, we made sure that we gave them a trigger warning because, yeah, these things can be in, intensely uh, intimate or personal for somebody, you know, who already has that sort of baggage with them or, you know, could be living in a similar experience. In Giant, we witnessed the last moments of a family um, as they're convincing their daughter that the approaching bomb blast is a giant that actually wants to play with her. Uh, and so we put haptics in the chair. So the audience was also surprised, but we let them know that it was going to be taking place in a conflict zone. So, you know, that if that was something that they didn't want to participate in, that they could opt out. But again, like we didn't know, we had to go uh, and buy tissues like right off the bat because people were crying in the headset. And that's kind of a, it's an interesting problem to have uh, for the sake of, you know, like what are sort of the, the rules around that. But also, it's, it makes it more difficult to get people through the experience uh, you know, in a timely fashion as well. But yeah, we're, we're seeing that you know, as things become more real, then there's also a chance to you know, possibly impact people. It's, it's, it's the, so it's social for you? You see it as a social impact? Well, I mean, if everyone's experiencing the same thing, that can be social. But again, you know, if it's a one-on-one -on -one experience, um, it's sort of like up to the filmmaker to make sure that they have the scruples, that they are playing by the rules. Because you know, there's right now most every piece of content is being released through Oculus Steam or Viveport. But there will be. It's not. It's it's heavily regulated right now. But as soon as you know, there's there's other means of of, of distributing the content. You know, it could take a different sort of face, you know. Certainly some exciting things to grapple on, great stuff. I want to get to the commercial angle, then we're going to talk more about the craft and the role of uh, artistry in, in, in the creating side of it. Gary, you're the commercial VR and uh, expert at Dell. You're commercializing this. You're going to be making the faster, faster machines. We want faster everything. I mean, everyone, anyone who's in VR knows that all the graphics cards. They know the speeds and feeds. They're totally hardware nerds. What's going on? Where's, where's the action? Okay. That's such a large question. I mean, we've, we've had some great stuff here that I also want to comment on as well. But uh, in, inside the commercial side, then, yeah, everybody wants bigger, stronger, better, faster. And to Winslow's comment about the dog years, that really puts the pressure on us to continue that innovation and, you know, working with partners like Intel to get those faster processors in there, get faster graphics cards in there so that we can get people more emotionally bought in. We can do better textures. We can get more immersion inside the, the content itself. Um, we're working a lot around uh, VR in terms of opening people's eyes for societal impact. So VR for good, for instance, where we're taking people to far-flung corners of the earth. We work with uh, Nat Geo explorer Mike Lebecki to show the plight of polar bears in Greenland and how they're gradually becoming extinct. You know, for an edutainment and a learning tool, the, the boundaries are really being pushed in entertainment and film. You know, that's always been the case. Consumer has always really pushed that technology. Commercial's always been a bit of a laggard. They want some stability in what's going on. But the, the creation that's going on here is absolutely fantastic. It's taken what is essentially a prosumer headset and then taken it into that commercial world and lit it up. 360 video, it's very inception. People are using it for training right, inside of their businesses. So that's now going out into, um, into businesses now. We're starting to see advances in 360 video with more compute power needed, where to the points about immersion and getting people emotionally bought in, then you can start doing volumetric, get them in there. But then we're also working with people like Dr. Skip Rizzo was on our panel yesterday, where we're starting to go into, okay, we can treat PTSD, uh, help people with autism, right, through the medium of VR. 
So again, that buys so into... these are disruptive use cases that are legit. These yeah, are big time, market moving, helping people. Absolutely. You know. right, and and that, that's where it becomes really, really powerful. Yes, you know, we want uh, companies to embrace it. Companies are embracing it for training. But when you start seeing the healthcare implications and you know, people crying inside of headsets, that's affecting you deeply emotionally. If you can make that for good and change somebody's trigger points inside of PTSD and the autism side of helping somebody in interview techniques to be able to be more self-sufficient, it's absolutely awesome. This is the new creative. So what's your take on the new creative? What's your definition? Because you're talking about a big range of use cases mm -hmm. beyond just filmmaking and digital artistry. Yeah, absolutely. So the new creative is like, with all the great work that's here, people are looking at film and entertainment. Now the world really is the oyster for all the creatives out there. People are clamoring out for modelers, artists, storytellers, story experiences, to be able to use that inside their commercial environments to make their businesses more effective but they're not going to have a 360 video production company inside of their mm -hmm. commercial organization. And it's then leveraging all of the creative here and all the great stuff here, which is really going to help the whole world along. Lisa, I want to get your thoughts on this because you guys at Intel here at the Tech Lounge have a variety of demos. But there's a range of pro and you know, entry-level tools that you know, can get someone up and running quickly to pro. And so there's a creative range, not only just for uh, you know, digital artistry, but also business we're hearing. So what's the, because AI is involved in a lot of this too, though. It's not just AI, it's a lot of these things. What's the, what's the Intel take on this? Well, I mean, it's really um, an interesting time for us at Intel because um, one of the things that we have that I think probably nobody else has, we have this amazing slate of products that really cover the end-to-end -end process both from the creation side of the house all the way to the consumption side. And, and you know, we talk a lot about our processors. You know, we worked on an amazing project, a, a couple of huge scenes for in, inside of the Sansar uh, environment, which is a great um, uh, tool for really democratizing the, the creation of, um, of, of spaces. It's a cloud-hosted service, and um, but it, it utilizes this amazing, you know, client-server um, architecture. Um, we created four huge spaces in, in a matter of um, eight weeks um, to launch at, at CES. Um, and, you know, in, in some of the, you know, t technologies that, you know, Gary was referring to just in pure processing power, you know, like two generations old processors were taking, you know, three hours to render um, just a small portion of a, of a model where our you know, newest generation Core i9s with our Optane technology took that time to 15 minutes. So when we think about where we, what we can do now, and that's, those technologies are gonna be available in even portable you know, laptop you know, um, um, form factors. You know, we've got you know, uh, the piece where we're, we were working with here, uh, Spheres, um, they were able to actually make some corrections and some tweaks, you know, basically, immediately and without having to send them off to some render form. They were able to do those things. And I know Winslow has talked about that as well. What does it mean to you to be able to react real time and be able to do your creative craft where you are and then be able to share that you know, so readily? Um, and then, you know, uh, I, I just think that's just kind of a, an amazing equalizer. It's really democratizing the, the, the creation process. Okay, the next question that begs for everyone to address is, where are we in this uh, progression? Uh, early, what work needs to get done? Where's the, where's where are we holding back? Is it the speeds and feeds? Is it the software? Is it the, is it the routines, libraries, art? Where's the bottleneck? Why isn't it going faster? Or is it going faster? Uh, I would, um, and I'm sure the 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 team would agree here. I would say um, that one of the key things is the creator tools themselves, right? They're they are still somewhat cumbersome. Um, I, we were talking to another filmmaker, like, you know, I can't even, I have to play the whole piece from the beginning, you know, I can't just go in and edit, you know, uh, change control, being able to collaborate on these pieces with other people. I mean, if you can collaborate in a real world space, you should be able to also collaborate in VR and have change control and all those sorts of things that are, that are necessary to, you know, the iteration of a project. So we, you know, we're trying to work with our software partners, they're all doing a really great job. Um, of trying to iterate that, but it's gonna take some time. I mean, I think that's probably the bigger thing that's holding everything back. We're gonna be right there with the processing power and the other technologies that we bring to the table. You know, um, our uh, OEM partners are gonna be right there with the best, you know, um, devices. I really think it's, it's um, 
something we've all got to push for as far as those tools getting better. Brooks, comment on anything? You, you're in the... So for, for me, the, the thing that's holding back VR in general is uh, actually the art form itself. Uh, one of the great challenges, if you look back at, say, the history of film, uh, we're at Sundance, so it's probably fairly apropos. Uh, very early on, the early movies were, aside from penny arcade machines that you'd actually stare at, they were 10-minute, almost like plays, that people would go to a, almost a playhouse, and they'd watch this thing. There were no cuts. There were no angles. It was a single wide shot. Uh, great Train Robbery came around, and there was this crazy thing they did called an edit, where they spliced film together. Uh, and uh, if you go back and you read, and they did these dolly shots, people will be, people will have no idea what they're watching. There's no way people will be able to follow that. Like the, people were not happy with it at the time. Uh, now it's stuff that children do on their IMAX at home. They do um, IMAX all the time. They do it on their iPhones, on their Android devices. These are normal languages of film that we have. VR doesn't have that yet. And there's not a great deal of effort being made in that direction. There's people here doing that. So I'm kind of speaking in the middle of the group. But outside of these people, there's only a handful who are really doing that. And it's a, it's a significant challenge. When people who are the mainstream consumer put on a VR headset, it needs to be more than just a magic trick where they go, oh, that's cool. And that, that tends to be the vast majority of experiences. So what is the thing that is going to make someone go, oh, I get why we have VR as a medium. And we're not there yet. We're in the direction. So but you mentioned the earlier problem. the um, the point where you can tell if someone's from film or uh, gaming or whatever when you talk to them about VR. Who is the future VR developer? Is it a filmmaker? Is it uh, a gamer? Is it a digital artist? I mean, what is this evolving... Oh, it's, it's a kid in his basement who no one knows and is screwing around with it and is going to do something that everyone thinks is stupid. Like, it's, it's, it's going to be that. It's uh, it, basically every major leap in gaming is kind of the same thing. It's when we understand how ludonarrative dissonance works inside of telling how people move around a space. It's about how we do Dutch angles suddenly in film, and these things get invented. It's, it's going to be some kid who's just screwing around who doesn't have the baggage of the language of film. Uh, a lot of the people I know in VR have been fortunate to work in film and games and interactive or web dev. So you come from a lot of places, but someone's going to come along who has none of that baggage, and they're going to be well. The you guys are pioneers, and you're doing it. So for the first person out there that's in their basement, that inspirational uh, uh, soundbite or comment, how could you guys talk to that person or that group? Because this is the democratization. This is what's happening. It's not the gatekeepers. It's real creatives out there. That could come from anywhere, YouTube generation, Twitch generation, gaming. What's, what would you say to that person to motivate them and to, and to give them that passion? Well, it's only going to get easier, faster, cheaper. Um, all these things are happening. But again, yeah, I, I totally agree with what Brooks said. You know, it's really about the culture and about educating the audience and getting them up to speed. There are some VR experiences that if, as soon as they put on the heads, like somebody who's never done it before, immediately will take it off because they'll get nauseated. And then there's people like kids who are like jet fighters. They've seen everything. You could throw like a 30, 30 frames per second experience at them and it doesn't even phase them. You know, they could be all of a sudden their, their worlds are changing and, and they're like, bring it because they're ready for that. So I think it's sort of about raising the bar for what the audience is, is comfortable with, familiar with, uh, educating the community. There's a lot of tools right now, you know, with Unreal and Unity that allow people who have very, you know, le they don't need to know C Sharp or C++. They can get started in a lot of like visual like what you see is what you get, being able to drag things into a virtual room. And uh, the, the Windows headsets that are out, you know, they refer to them as mixed reality, but just even having the ability to flip up the screen and transition from the virtual world to the real world in you know, milliseconds, it allows you to be able to create things more at the speed of thought. Instead of coming up with an idea, you know, coding it, making sure it works, and then eventually putting on the headset, the sooner that we can actually be ideating inside this virtual environment is when things will get really interesting. So the next question is, uh, to, to take it to the next level is, What's the playbook? How does someone get involved? How does someone ingratiate into a community? If I'm an artist, I want to get, and I'm proficient with technology or maybe not, how do they get involved? Is it community driven? Is it social? You guys mentioned social social's a big trend here. How do people get involved? What's the, what's the track? Well, yeah, you don't just need to, you know, go to a, like a, a grad school or, you know, there's a lot of uh, programs out there that are popping up. Almost every single, you know, major state school has like an interactive art program now, and that wasn't the case like two or three years ago. Uh, so we're seeing that that's a big shift in the culture. But again, VR is still, it, it's expensive. And it's, you know, like VR I refer to, it's in the stage of it, like, it's almost like in the Neo Geo phase, maybe a little before that. But it's the really expensive thing that your friend's neighbor has, you know? Like, 
it, or his older brother or something. You know, you get to play it a little bit, you're like, that's great, but there's no way in hell I'm going to, you know, I can't afford that or like that just doesn't really work with my life style right now. So it needs to incorporate itself into our everyday, our habits. And it needs to be something that some, if we're all doing it, then it makes sense for us to do it together, not just somebody in their basement doing it by themselves. Yeah, feel free to comment. This is a good topic. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So what we're doing, it's all about democratization and accessibility. So for people to get into it, then they're going to need a rig, they're going to need a headset. And previously, it's actually been quite expensive to actually take that first plunge into it. So now by democratizing and bringing price points down, it makes it more accessible. That helps content creators because there's now more of an audience that can now consume that content. And the people that can then play with the medium and consume it now have a better reason to do it. So we're working on that. We're also working on the education pieces like key is actually going out there to schools and actually letting them experience VR and play with VR because it is a whole new different medium. We've seen uh, film directors and filmmakers go into the VR space and things that worked in 2D film like fast pans and whatever else to the points that have already been made don't really translate into VR without somebody losing their lunch. So yeah, it is going to be somebody who's coming up who hasn't got the baggage of previous skill sets inside of 2D doing it inside of VR. So we're going to see that. And uh, in terms of the technology, everybody's wanting things to progress. That shows the level of excitement out there and that uh, everybody wants to get into it. Everybody wants to see it go further. And I'm reminded of the mobile phone. Right? Mobile phone 30 years ago, two suitcases for batteries, a large brick on the ear and a car antenna. Okay, so where we are now, if you, if you had a time machine and you went back in time to talk to the inventor of the mobile phone, well, I'd be a lot richer because I know sports results in now, but yeah, that, that aside. Um, but you go back and talk to them and you say, do you know in 30 years' time, everybody is going to be carrying that device. Everybody's going to be dependent on that device. They're going to get social anxiety and separation anxiety if they lose it. And they would probably laugh in your face. All right, so since you brought up the phone analogy, since I love that example, um, are we in the BlackBerry moment of uh, VR and no one yet has built the iPhone? Because the iPhone was a seminal moment for smartphones and you see what happened there. Is, is VR needing that kind of break? Is it, or is it there? I, I think we're, we're on the cusp. Where we are at the moment with technology, we've uh, had the headsets, which I'd say have been more in the consumer space. They've been designed to hit a certain price point. Uh, we had CES the other week where we've had advancements now in the resolutions of headsets that are now coming out. One of the issues was, oh, I can't see text, I can't read text. So from a, a working environment, if you're actually using tools that you would normally use on a, a 2D screen, you can now translate that and read that text. However, in terms of the tools that people use, why are we trying to put 2D screens into a VR headset? We've got a whole new way of interacting with data. We've got a whole new way of doing things that are going to be more intuitive than the mouse and keyboard interaction that we're used to. Why just translate that? Let's push that envelope. And those are the developments that we're pushing our partners and our ISVs to really embrace. That's an evolution. So we can do that. It, it's absolutely. You guys have any thoughts on that, uh, that comment? Are we have that inflection point? Are we hitting that? Are we see it soon? Is it here? Well, I think it's a very interesting um, symbiotic relationship between um, multiple factors. So, you know, we hear the cost factor, we hear, you know, the technology factor, then we have the content factor. You know, and I saw an interesting evolution um, at, at CES. We had, had created this virtual booth experience so that you could still come to CES, the Intel booth, without actually having to be there. And I met a guy in there and I was like, hey, where, where are you? He goes, I've been in here like all week. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I was like, oh, yeah, where do you live? He goes, he goes, he goes, oh, I'm in my basement in Nebraska, you know. And, but he had just, on, this was Friday when I met him. He'd been in there all week but in 2D mode. And he had gone out the night before and bought a headset just so he could come back and go in, in, in VR mode. And I think, you know, yes, all of these factors have to kind of line up. But I do think that content those experiences that are going to keep people coming back for more. Like, you know, these guys literally kept coming back to our booth, right? To see, who was, to, to, to see who was there. And to them at that point, it wasn't really a barrier of cost. It was like, there is something that I want to consume. Therefore, I am going to go get what I need to consume it. And I, I use the analogy of HDTV, right? When, there were, when we kind of moved over that, yeah. that hump where there was enough content People really didn't care how much Sports that television great, cost. Sports really highlighted right? HD. Yeah. But this is a good point. This is the, a good question to, to ask. Brooks, I'd love to get your thoughts. 
content drives experiences, amazing experiences, but we're building the scaffolding of everything at the same time. So wh where are we? What's your opinion? Well, so uh, here on the Starbury side, we're fortunate because we have our own headset. We have the Star VR headset we've been building with Acer, it's 5K, all of that stuff, and we're upgrading it over the next year. Our focus has been, uh, we skipped the consumer market very much. We went straight to location-based and enterprise. And the reason we did that is because the, there's a promise of VR at a basic, I don't want to say technology standpoint, but from an experience perspective when it comes to that resolution, when it comes to that field of view, when it comes to these things people expect, average consumers who go to a movie and they see these giant screens, they want that translated. They don't have the understanding like we do of, well, LED panels are actually a pain in the ass to build and it takes a little bit and they flip it at their own speeds. We need time to photon is not a thing my dad will ever say in his life. <laughs> uh, but it's, there, there's a reality that people have a need for that. And it's, it is extremely expensive. It's, it, again, the reason we went straight to LBE. But for us, it's about marrying the two and consistently trying to match what's happening. So when we're talking about, you know, I, as I mentioned earlier, the technology and how we're standing on the shoulders of giants, very, very quickly, someone who's doing technology is going to see what we're doing content-wise and go, well, I can do that better technology-wise. And then we're just going to keep leapfrogging. And it's very similar to the phone in the same way that uh, we're not at the final stage of the phone. Like, we're at our stage of the phone, and no doubt in 30 years people will laugh at us for carrying anything. Yeah. Uh, the same way we laugh about the briefcases and the giant batteries and the cars we had to pull with us. Uh, so it's, it's, it's one of those things that's continually transitional, and VR's in an odd, amazing place. Well, you know, there's a lot of waves that we've all seen. You mentioned the, the mobile phone. That's a good one to point to. It feels like the PC revolution to me because the same culture of entrepreneurs and pioneers come from a bunch of different backgrounds. So I'd like to get uh, uh, Brooks and, and perspective and Winston perspective, Winslow's perspective on this because I think there's an entrepreneurial culture out there right now that's just emerging very fast. And it's not like your classic entrepreneur, software developer. So in this movement, this wave, the entrepreneur is the filmmaker. It could be the kid in the basement. It could be the gamer. Those entrepreneurs are trying to find a path yeah, it's, it's a weird mix. Uh, VR is at this odd point where it's uh, not only is it the people who are wanting to be cutting edge in terms of content or technology, but also that first mover strategy from the business side of things. And so everyone wants to be those guys who are charging ahead because in reality, if you look at the financials around all of this, VR is one of those things that you don't want to finance. It's not nearly as safe as, say, Marvel Avengers or, <laughs> or uh, you know, the next Call of you Duty. Gotta be, you got to be, you got to hustle. You, you got to hustle. You've What's, your work at it. What's your advice? What's your advice? It, start doing it. it that's, that's really it. It's the same advice I used to give to game makers when people would be like, well, I want to learn how to make games. It's like, go to YouTube, download a thing, and go do it. There's literally no reason why you can't Are there meetups? There's like the Homebrew Computer Club that's there are, on the Mac? There are infinite groups of in VR people who are more than happy to give you all the terrible and wonderful <laughs> opinions that come with that. There, there's no shortage of people. There's, there's no shortage, and it's an amazingly helpful group because everyone wants someone else to figure out something so they can steal that and then figure out something else. Winslow, your advice to entrepreneurs out there that are you know, young and or you know, from 14 to 50, what should, they, what should they do? Jump right in, obviously, is a good one. Well, yeah, I mean, experiment, break things. Uh, that's really the only way to learn. I would say watch as much VR as you can because sometimes bad VR is the best VR because you can learn, don't do that. And if you, if you learn, if you put all that together, then you can really, you know, it's like this lexicon that you can really follow. Um, also, I think, you know, we, I think as people in tech, you know, we kind of get obsessed with things like resolution, frame rate, uh, and these are very important, but it's also, you know, good to remember, or at least for me, you know, I watched some of the best experiences from storytelling when I was a kid, you know, eight years old on a 12-inch screen that was 640 by 480, you know, with like scan lines on the VHS. But for me, it, it, the story still resonated, and it's important to think of the story first, but Obviously, it's a dance between the story and the technology. They kind of have to both organically work together. And if they don't, then you know, one thing in the story that, that doesn't work because the tech isn't supporting it you know, can throw you out of the experience. Other concern entrepreneurs might have is financing. How do I get someone to help me oh, build yeah. it? Uh, and then doing relationships, finding relationships that could you know, one plus one equals more than two, right? So how do you? So you have to get really creative when it comes to, to funding right now, uh, unless you're doing location-based, which also you know, re requires a certain amount of investment to get it up to a bar where you want to be you know, showing it to people with all the haptic effects when it's you know, heat, smell, uh, vibration, stuff like that. You know, that's not cheap to develop. Um, but it, as far as like, you know, working with film foundations, we, we were fortunate enough to be sponsored by uh, Fledgling Fund and Chicken and Egg. But we also were able to, to get partnerships with people like Intel uh, and NVIDIA. 
and also work with people who, uh, you know, come from a traditional film background. There's not one way to, to successfully fund a project. There's a million, and that's why it's interesting that the technology is innovating, but also the marketplace is as well. One of the things I want to ask is, as any, any new industry gets building, is cultures form early, DNA forms in the entrepreneurs and the pioneers. Um, and one of the big hottest topics in the creative world is inclusion and diversity. So what's the makeup of the culture of the, this, new, this new generation? Because the democratization means everyone can participate, everyone's involved. Um, what's the state of the community vis-a-vis -vis diversity, inclusion, uh, and the role of the, the actors in, in the community? Well, I think it's important to understand that VR has a profound ability to place you in somebody else's shoes. Um, the, the trick, though, is to make sure that those feel like they're your shoes. But I think that we're, we're learning a lot more about storytelling techniques. And uh, we're able to empower people that their voices you know, were previously not heard. Um, the, the tricky thing is being able to, yeah, educate uh, you know, all different groups of people how to use the technology. But once they're enabled and empowered to do it, it's amazing what you can experience inside the headset. Um, so VR can be an enabler for education, outreach, a variety of things? Yes, I mean, the term, you know, empathy, empathy machine, you know, gets thrown around a lot. You could do a drinking game around it, you know, for, for panels uh, when people are talking about it. But it's important to know that there is a truth to that. Um, and it, it's, yeah, the perspective shift from, you know, looking at a screen, a 16 by 9 screen, where you can look away and then dissolving the screen and becoming that person, becoming the director, the actor, the, the camera person, the editor. It, it, when you're in the first person perspective, there's so much more, you know, it feels more personal, and that's a, a really interesting angle that, that we're going so to So you can walk in someone's shoes, literally. Yes, you literally can. You just have to make sure that you've got a, the tracking systems proper, or else you'll look like there's, you know, so it's like a, it can become a horror movie pretty quickly if your leg is behind your head. Lisa, your thoughts on this, I know it's important to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's fascinating because I've, I've been in tech for a really long time and um, seen many, many trends. I mean, the first job I had at Intel was I was a PC tech, and as you can imagine, as a female, I think there was one other tech female <laughs> in the department at the time, and I would get funny looks when I would show up with my bag. You know, they were like, hi, can I help you? I'm like, I'm not here to deliver coffee. I'm here to fix yeah. your computer, you know? So I've seen a lot of trends, and it's, it's super exciting to me to see um, so much diversity cross culture, cross country. I mean, you know, we're, we're having guys, you know, we had, you know, guys come in from, you know, all over the world, from even war torn, you know, they've escaped their country just several years ago, and, and they're coming in, they're bringing all that creativity to the, to the market. We're seeing a very, very strong female contingent um, from the, the filmmaker perspective. So it's, it's this wonderful, wonderful, just primordial soup of people that I think, you know, are growing their own voice and their own power. They're breaking molds as far as how you actually get content produced. It's, you know, distribution is, is going is kind of crazy right now. I mean, how do you get it distributed? There's like so many different ways, and but all of those things are so important to the evolutionary and biological process of this that we kind of, yes, we need to let it go. And sometimes we're frustrated. We're like, where's the standards? Where's the one ring to rule them all? Where there's not gonna be one, and it's good for us that there's not right now. Um, it's frustrating from a business perspective. Sometimes you're like, I, I can't, you know, peanut butter myself around, you know, all of these places. But I think it's just a very unique time where so many people are, are weird, the technology is accessible. That means that so many creators can now bring their fresh voice to this space, and it's just gonna be fascinating to continue to watch. That's awesome. Well, two more questions, um, and, and, and I'll give you some time to think about the last one, which is your perspective on Sundance, what's happening this year, uh, your personal view of what you think's happening, what might happen this, at there in this year. But the question I have for you now is to go down the line. We'll start with Brooks uh, here and talk about the coolest thing that you're involved in right now. Well, I, it actually has to be Hero. I mean, we're, de we're debuting it here at Sundance. We've been working on it and not talking about it for about nine months. Uh, and it's been very difficult. Uh, again, it's, it, it's sacrosanct to the experience that you don't know literally what you're getting into. Uh, and the emotional response has been essentially our goal, trying to find out how far can we take that you actually being in a space, moving around, having that interactivity, doing what you would do, but it being your story and how deeply we can absolutely affect a human being. And again, watching people come out, uh, it's, it's one of those things, I, I've been doing game development, I've worked on films, I've done all kinds of stuff, uh, and you usually get a chance when someone experiences something you've made, you walk up and you go, so what do you think? And that's not at all what we can do with ours. Because How's it impacted you, that reaction? Um, well, I, I personally suffer a significant PTSD, and I've had some traumas in my life. 
Uh, and so it's been, uh, it's been incredibly powerful to be able to share these things with people, share this emotion in a deeply profound yet amazingly personal way, which uh, it's, it's, I'm amazingly fortunate to be able to be a part of it. All right, thanks for sharing. Coolest thing that's going on with you right now here at Sundance. Oh, just the fact that I'm here at all, I mean, is, is incredible, right? Um, I personally was able to be an advisor on the Spheres project that is premiering here with Eliza McNitt. She's someone who, um, you know, was a Intel Science Fair winner back um, in high school and kind of came back to us. And um, so just to see the evolution of an artist really from the beginning and to, to the point where, you know, um, they've been able to, you know, come here to, to Sun Sundance. Um, I'm also I'm very passionate about the work that we're doing with Sansar. Um, uh, I'm you know kind of consider myself you know one of the chief storytellers at Intel around virtual reality and this new move into social where people are like, well, what's this game? I'm like, it's not it's not a game. It's you are the game. You are the interactivity. You become the person that makes the interest the this the space interesting. Um, we're just really setting the scene for you. And there's so many, you know, there's a lot of different people kind of chasing this, you know, be togetherness. Um, but what we've been able to produce there and just to be able to explore some of my own personal ideas has just been such a, such a gift. Um, but then, then to be working with, you know, guys like these on the, the panels and see what they're doing and just be in touch is really just an exciting time. Awesome. Uh, <clears throat> probably what, you know, other than the people and the projects, or the projects that are being shown here. We're working on our new project, um, which we would have loved to premiere here, but uh, we, we did the, basically when you get in, you have two months to create a piece. You have a demo and then you have to finish it. So we're taking a little bit more time. This one's gonna be about a year uh, development cycle. Uh, it's called Breathe, where we uh, take you from where Giant left off, where uh, in Giant, the ceiling collapses on a family, uh, but they're in front of you. Uh, but in this experience, we use a breathing apparatus to basically bring yourself back to, to, to life, and then you realize you're trapped under rubble, and you, you remove the, we actually wanna have physical objects on top of you that are gonna be tracked. So you're moving rubble from you, and you realize that you're a six-year-old girl, you're the survivor from Giant, and you get to witness what it's like to be uh, you know, a future refugee, sort of uh, in different key moments of her life that use breath, whether it's a flirtatious moment, blowing a dandelion, seeing your own breath in, in snow as a drone shows you a message that your parents pre-recorded on your 18th birthday. This is all in the future, obviously. Uh, but every time you walk around an object, uh, you actually grow 10 to 15 years older in the experience. So as you get older, the world becomes smaller. And then we witness what it's like for her last breath, from being six years old to being 90 years old. Uh, but it's a profound personal experience. That sounds cool. Go. Gary, coolest thing that you're involved in right now at Sundance. Wow. If I was going to say it was all cool, that would be a bit trite. <laughs> um, but they say if you enjoy what you do, is it really a job? I, and I'm lucky enough to be in that position because working with all these, these guys here and like people around the place, they're doing such great things that you know, every day I wake up and I'm astounded of where the industry's going. In terms of what we're doing here at Sundance, then we're really starting to push those envelopes as well. I've been lucky enough to be involved with Dunkirk and Spider-Man Homecoming like last year, so some great pieces there. And then moving out into this year, you know, we've got some other developments which I can't mention at this point, but we're showing things like AR and VR mashups. So we haven't talked much about augmented reality here. Uh, it's, uh, it's an evolutionary, it's not a replacement, both can be used. And we've started to really start to blend those two technologies now so you can still see the outside world. Just touching on the commercial side, and healthcare is very big for me, that's, that's where I think the really cool stuff is happening. Entertainment is great, right? And that's really pushing the envelope and allowing us to then take it for the good of humankind. Content's everywhere, it's not just entertainment. It's yeah, business. absolutely. I mean, you start looking at MRI scans inside of um, VR or AR, talking a patient through it so they can actually see exactly what you're talking about. Uh, you're now no longer pointing at flat, you know, things on a screen, you're now actually taking them through it. If you're using AR, you can actually judge the, re the, the responses of the patient mm -hmm. as to how they're reacting to the news. And effectively, inside of the VR, and what's really cool for me is seeing people's reaction to that content and to the entertainment content. That's awesome. Okay, final question. Um, this is a little bit of self-serving because I'd like you to help me do my job at uh, Silicon Angle. If you were a reporter and you were going to report the most important stories happening this year at Sundance or really kind of what's really happening uh, versus what's kind of being built to, to be happening here, what's the story? What is the story this year at Sundance 2018 in your 
personal perspective. We'll go down the line and, and share your observations. Okay, well, mine, mine here, I'm a, I'm a Sundance newbie. Right? This is my, my first year of being here. Um, absolutely astounded by the community spirit that's around. I go to a lot of uh, technical trade shows and technical presentations. People coming here with a willingness to learn, wanting to learn from other people. It's been touched on already. It's, it's the pool of knowledge that's available inside of Sundance that everybody that comes here can actually tap into to create better content, to learn, to learn not what to do, as well as learn what to do. I, and I just think that's brilliant because in that community spirit, that's really going to help enable this industry quickly. Awesome. Winslow, you got some experience. What's your thoughts? Uh, obviously, the, this Intel uh, house, uh, <laughs> just a little plug for you, Lisa. Um, <laughs> Check lounge. <laughs> we got that? OK, good. Um, no, uh, I mean, yeah, the, the people that, that's here, and every, every year we come here and see you know, where the, the high watermark is. Um, you know, all, all these people uh, are, some of these teams first started with two people, and then they grew to six, and then by the end of it, there's 100 people working around the clock, you know, pulling all-nighters to be able to give the, the latest and greatest of what's available with these, these current tools. Um, so it's, it's amazing because it's, it's the work itself doesn't really mean anything until people get to experience it. And so that's nice that it's, they make a big splash. The people here are very attentive to it. Um, you know, it's, it's a very nice audience. And that, this will continue the momentum for, for future festivals uh, throughout the year. But also, you know, will it excite people that have never done VR before. People who have never been to Sundance before, we're seeing that there's a lot of, of new people. And that will, you know, continue to, to influence, you know, many years to come. So you think VR is the top story here being well, told? So now, I mean, so as far as like, just to generalize, I would say last year was kind of the big VR year. This is kind of the big AR year. Next year is going to be the AI year. And then after that, we're going to start putting them all together. Great, great feedback. Uh, I think it's just exciting for Intel just to be back here. I think Intel hasn't been here in quite some time. You know, Delp coming, coming in here. I think probably one of the breakout years for us to come back and really talk to creators about what we're doing from the Intel studios all the way through to the stuff you can take home and do it at, do at home. And, um, you know, I think coming in, I feel like we're, we're coming back here with a purpose, really, not just to be here to be seen. We're really here with real things and ha want to have real conversations on how tech can enable um, what people are doing, not really, you know, not just from a brand perspective, but from, from a real hands-on yeah, point of view. Great demos, too, the phenomenal tech. It really just, yeah, we're just, everything from um, uh, the AI stuff we have to the social to the, you know, the great new pieces that have been submitted here, like we mentioned, um, with Sphere. So uh, I, I think, yeah, it's, it doesn't feel gratuitous to me, you know, that Dell or Intel is here this year. It's really, we're really, come, we've really come with a purpose. You guys are moving the needle. It's really awesome. We need more horsepower. Out. <laughs> Brooks, your thoughts on, on Sundance this year? Observation, the vibe, uh, what would you tell your friend back home when, when yeah, you get for, back? For me, it would be, I think, uh, it's almost a non-story. It's like the opposite of a story. It's it's the just deep integration of VR into the normal Sundance flow. I think has been interesting. Uh, some people have been here for a few years, and back in the day when it was one or two, it was a lot of oh, you do VR? What's that then? Uh, whereas now you see a lot more people who are crossing over, going to see documentaries, and they come to see a VR piece, and it's it's just a part of the normal flow. And the the team at New Frontier has done exceptional work to kind of make sure that they have this ridiculous high level of broad content for all kinds of people, all different kinds of experiences, all high-end things. But it's not that VR is here. Oh, good, we have a VR section. It's a lot more of an integrated setup, and it's been really encouraging to see. Well, you guys have been great. It's been very inspirational, great information. Um, you guys are reimagining the future and building it at the same time, so entrepreneurially and also with content and technology. So thanks so much for sharing on this panel of new creative. This is Silicon Angles, the Cube's coverage of Sundance 2018 here at the Intel Tech Lounge at the Sundance Film Festival. I'm John Furrier. Thanks for watching.